gone back and forth about often is sort of this idea of whether a man who is abusive to his wife or his girlfriend or his partner um, can still be a good dad. Mm. And that is an issue that I think, you know, um, fam- the family court system is confused about. <laughs> Welcome to the Audacious Life Podcast, where your host, Stephanie Roberts, welcomes you to listen to women from all walks of life, share their stories of finding freedom from abuse. You'll hear experts give you real advice on what you need to do to create hope for your future, make a plan, and see that light at the end of the tunnel. You'll learn how to build yourself up spiritually mentally, physically, financially, and legally. One in four women have experienced some form of abuse. And 80% of women who leave abusive relationships go back. It's time to change that statistic and give you the audacious life you've always wanted. A life of freedom, peace, and true joy. Put on your headphones and get ready to be inspired. I just want to welcome Sarah. Sarah is here today with her story of getting out. And that is not her real name. She's still in kind of a precarious situation a year beyond her departure. And she's going to share her story with us. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you. So the first question I have for you is... You know how it sounds like you had a dramatic exit, and I just want to know what what was it that happened, or when? You don't have to tell me the details, but when did you know? When did it click inside of you that you absolutely had to just get out? Um. Well, I feel like there was a lead up to the dramatic exit. Um, I knew that I was unhappy in the relationship, and there were times when. I would look at my husband and I would, you know, instead of feeling love, I would feel fear, Mm. um, bordering on hate sometimes. And that was a really scary feeling for me. Um, I wasn't quite sure how it had gotten to that point. Um, but I, I felt a lot of guilt about having those feelings and, um, you know, there were certain things that I could put my finger on. Like I, I felt like, you know, instead of having a, a marriage that was, um, you know, based on an equal partnership, we had a very parent-child relationship where he was the parent and I was the child and I could never do anything right and, you know, I was mm-hmm. lazy or I couldn't clean the house right or I, you know, whatever, kind of everything under the sun. Um, so I felt like he was, you know, I remember telling him I felt like he was my dictator or my boss as opposed mm-hmm. to... Uh, being an equal partner. So I knew that there was something off and um, I just kept making excuses for it, for why, you know, he was acting this way and I kept trying to make it work. Um, But when I really knew that I had to leave was when the abuse escalated uh, to a physical nature. And, um, you know, looking back, I'm, I'm actually surprised at myself for not being able to pinpoint the abuse sooner uh, but I was I was very foggy about it I um, you know I've even done domestic violence work in my life and somehow couldn't figure out um, <clears throat> that that's what I was experiencing because so much of it was psychological and so much of it was emotional and verbal um, so so yeah, the you know there was one night when the abuse became particularly, um, I would say, sadistic and physical, and um, it was terrifying, and it involved my children, and so that's I mean I left the next morning in my pajamas, and it was like you know it was like the blinders just kind of were ripped off of my eyes, and I could kind of finally see what what had been going on. Wow. So where did you go? Did you have family nearby or friends or? Yeah, I do. My parents live in town, thankfully. Um, so I was able to, I mean, I, 
I really didn't have a plan. I just knew that I had to get out of the house. And so um, I took my children and, uh, you know, we left in our pajamas and went over to have breakfast with my parents. And over the course of breakfast, um, I just started crying and, you know, slowly started uh, to let them know what had happened the night before. And they were incredulous. I mean, they had no idea that we were even having issues. Um, Mm -hmm. We put on a pretty good show, (laughs) I would say, to the public. Our our relationship was fairly public because we Mm -hmm. had a business together. And um, so, yeah, I mean, they, they really didn't know that there was anything wrong. And I think through talking to them, I remember, I remember describing, you know, what had happened the night before to my mom and, uh, and her saying, you know, that's abuse. And it was the first time that I think the, the word had come out, you know, and I had been able to, you know, without any atmosphere and I could, I don't know, it was, um, it was intense to, to hear that and to, to have to really you know, hear it and know that that was what had been happening in my relationship, in my marriage. Yeah. Um, So that was, was that really the first time you put that label on what you were going through? Hearing it from your mom? Yes. Wow. Absolutely. That is intense. Yeah, it was really intense. (sighs) So what did they want you to do? I mean, what was, what was their advice to you? about your situation? Um, I mean, I think that they, they have a wonderful relationship. They're, you know, absolutely equals have been married for, you know, almost 40 years and really, uh, you know, I think at first they were hoping that we could reconcile and that, you know, maybe he was just really stressed out because of our business. And, you know, there was just a lot going on in our lives. Um, Mm. You know, ra- raising young children is stressful in itself yeah. and uh, causes a lot of people to, um, you know, get on to shaky terms with each other and some, some people get divorced in that time. And so I think they were sort of hoping that uh, it was just a situational kind of stress related um, thing. So I think, you know, they really encouraged me to... Um, to talk with him and to to try to work it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we don't, my, my family doesn't have a whole lot of experience with divorce or separation or, uh, you know, especially when children are involved, that's just not really been a reality that, that I've ever, that I grew up with or that they've really known either. So mm-hmm. we were just kind of, I, I think they were operating on, um, on hope, you know, hope mm-hmm. that it wasn't really as bad, <laughs> yeah. but it became very clear, you know, he, he, um, my ex-husband was completely unwilling to admit that, you know, he had crossed the line or that, um, that he had done anything wrong, was mm-hmm. unwilling to apologize, unwilling to really, you know, put in the work to, to go to counseling. Um, so it became pretty clear pretty quickly to, to, to my parents, I think that, this was not a situation that was going to be reconciled and, mm. you know, that there was going to be a divorce. Wow. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Undolis.com. You've taken control of your life this far, so why not take control of your dating too? The choice is yours. Check out Undolis.com. Undolis.com has leveraged the power of the feminine collective. That's right, the sisterhood. There are lots of other women out there like you, and they don't want to date a creepy guy or stalker type, and they don't want you to end up with one either. You'd both rather have the good guy. So maybe that guy who didn't work out for them, he'll be perfect for you. And maybe your dud date is their diamond. Undolis is a place where women can gather, share their thoughts on the men they've spent time dating, whether on a date or a full relationship. Andolis can perform a simple background check, too, and cross-reference it with women's ratings to give you a dateability score. How cool is that? So go ahead, check out Andolis.com, U-N-D-O-L-U-S.com. 
Come on, leave some dirt on your ex and help a sister out. Or rate that guy who was sweet but didn't quite work out for you. Heck, you can even leave a review on your best guy friend, the one who's having trouble finding Mrs. Right. Let's help the good guys float to the top. Use promo code ALIFE50 to get 50% off your monthly membership. You've got power, so let's wield it. Let's use the Feminine Collective, sign up today, rate your date, and let's build this database so we have a safe place to go to find the good guys and start dating again. Go to undolus.com, U-N-D-O-L-U-S.com. So you're looking back a year later. When you look back, what do you think are the things that helped you get out of that? I mean, obviously you, you just left, but Mm -hmm. I know you and I think that you're doing great. (laughs) What are the things that you think, (laughs) welcome. What are the things (laughs) that you think that, that you did having your family there has to be huge. So apart from that, Mm -hmm. what are the other things that you would say that you could point to? that have helped you get through this? I think that I lived for so long covering up what was going on. Um, And obviously, you know, like I said, I didn't realize that it was abuse, but I I knew that he was controlling. And I knew that we had an unequal uh, partnership. And I knew that um, there were things that just didn't feel right. And I was pretty miserable. And I didn't really admit it to anybody. And so when I left, it was like the shedding of all of that. You know, I just, I reached out to friends. I uh, joined a support group. I um, did a ton of Googling and reading books that really turned the light bulb on for me. And I, um, I, I did a lot of waiting through the past, mm-hmm. uh, which... I think I think I'm I'm coming to the end of needing to do that now, sort of in my healing process. But it was really important in the beginning mm-hmm. to you know to look at how I had ended up in this situation. I'm I'm educated. I'm you know I've never I didn't grow up exposed to unhealthy relationships or to abuse dynamics. So um, it was it was really curious and confusing to me as to how I had had ended up in this relationship and um, jumped so, you know, head first into it. Uh, so, so I mean, I found a great therapist. I, I, I really just, you know, I didn't hide it anymore. And um, I admitted that I had missed a bunch of red flags. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I just kind of opened my eyes as wide as they could, could be and tried to just sort of learn uh, I don't know, learn the the solar system that I was, uh, you know, living within. I, I had to, I felt like um, a fish out of water. You know, I didn't, I didn't know the terminology and I didn't know where to look. And I, I just sort of cobbled, to, cobbled it all together. Um, but it took a lot of support. I mean, it took, it took reconnecting with friends that I had been isolated from. It took, um, admitting that that I had been wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, it took a full shedding of my ego for sure. And wow. um, yeah. So how did you do that with, it sounds like if you had a business in the community and you both had this image together that was yeah. projected positively, when you started shedding that false image, how did that work out for you? I mean, obviously if you have friends who've been friends from before you knew him, that's one thing. But what about those other Mm -hmm. people? How did they react to you? Well, I mean, I have to say, I wasn't out, uh, you know, in town talking about this with everybody. I I mean, I did, I pretty much have been hiding under a rock for the last year. Mm -hmm. But but in that rock, I have brought with me, you know, friends that I've known for a long time that, Mm -hmm. um, that are separate from him. Um, I have, you know, so so I brought with me, I guess, my safe people that I could really, you know, vent to and cry to. And um, mm-hmm. I, I would say, I mean, there are some people that, that, you know, know, have only known me in this relationship. 
that I did reach out to because I felt, you know, safe doing so. And they were just as, they were very surprised. I mean, my ex-husband is a master at uh, appearing very, mo- you know, modest and humble and salt of the earth. And he has a really, really different public persona than he does um, in private and, and with people who are very close to him. And so um, it was it was a surprise for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, and obviously there is a fine line between being out in the community and bashing somebody uh, yes. and and just speaking your truth. And I think mm-hmm. that's, so, so I really have have erred on the side of, um, you know, really only opening up to people that I trust and know very well. Right. Right. Um, so think, it's not like, you know, our business customers know what's going on. Right, right. And I think that that's why I asked the question, because anybody listening to this, right. you know, I just want to make sure that they know that there are safe people and then there are people that you have to go with your instincts and just know it's not a good decision to share it. And yes. not only that, it doesn't feel good to have people not believe you when you've been through something. So, you know, mm-hmm. life shattering and um, yeah. So just making those decisions wisely. And I think from, from the, the perpetrator's perspective, it seems that they assume that you're out there spreading the word around when that's not the mm-hmm. reality at all. You're really just, connecting to people who will listen and like you said you know kind of give you the comfort and help you to feel safe and listen to and supported and that's not the same thing as kind of standing on the mountaintops or in the center of town <laughs> doing yep, thing. absolutely and believe me there have been many times when i've wished i could stand on the mountaintops and right. stream it you know because i just you know there's there's um my ex has a new girlfriend now and mm-hmm. I I just keep sending her positive energy and you know I've never met her obviously but I um, I want her to listen to her gut and her instincts and I'm, I'm sure that the red flags are already popping up and so you know there have definitely been times when I've just felt as a woman like I want to you know, scream it from the mountaintops and protect all of these other women. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's everybody's own journey. And mm-hmm. um, had I had someone screaming from the mountaintop when I became involved with this man, you know, I wouldn't have listened. And mm. um, so, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I have, I've been pretty quiet about it, you know, aside mm-hmm. from, from just entrusting the, the information with my friends and, and close family. Right. Right. Yeah. Smart. Yeah. I understand that. So, um, mm-hmm. there's something else I was going to ask you. And I think you were talking about looking back and kind of trying to figure out what it is about you or the circumstances that allowed you to be in this and ignore those red flags. What did mm-hmm. you, what did you determine? It sounds like you have an amazing, family your parents are loving they're equal partners Mm -hmm. sounds like they were very loving and supportive of you and continue to be so so what did you determine looking back like what did you find as an answer or is there no (laughs) well no I think there are lots of answers I mean uh, part of it part of it I've just sort of had to let go of and and you know there I, I feel like um there, there is a part of this that is just, I found a very manipulative person. And he was able to reflect back, you know, ask me questions like, what do I, what do you want in your life? And, and I would, I, you know, wear my heart on my sleeve and just kind of open up and, um, you know, <laughs> share my hopes and dreams. And then he would kind of reflect that, those back to me so that I felt like we were on the same page. And, um, so there, there are things, you know, looking back that I, I realized that he was maybe not even consciously doing, but that he was doing. He's a, he's a very, very skilled manipulate, manipulator. Um, but my part of it is I think that um, I think I was too trusting. I think in general in my life I've probably been a little too trusting. Uh, I, 
I think that, and I, and I hate to say that because I, you know, I, I sort of miss that part of myself. That I'm definitely not um, overly trusting anymore. I feel like I've been hurt pretty significantly at this point. So that's, that's a healing um, piece that's happening right now within me. But um, I think, I think that I was at a, I was at a place in my life where I had been in, in multiple relationships with men who were just unwilling to commit. They mm-hmm. were, you know, kind of scared of having a family, um, scared of marriage, you know, those kinds of, of people I seemed to be attracting. And, and finally, you know, I found this, this guy who actually I was not really that attracted to or interested in, in a relationship with at the beginning, but he was mm-hmm. very, very, he pursued me very heavily. And that was, a, I mean, that should have been a red flag. <laughs> so I missed that one. Um, and I held him off for, for months. And then at, at a certain point, you know, I just kind of gave in. There was just a lot of attention being directed towards me and it felt good. And he was creative about, you know, he would show up and, and leave me presents on my doorstep. And, you know, he was, he was pursuing me quite heavily. And at a certain point, I just, you know, I, he wasn't scared of marriage. He wasn't scared of having a family. He already had a young child and I looked at him and thought he was a really good father. And, um, I just sort of fell into it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I could see that all makes so much sense. I mean, if you are kind of hoping that you find somebody who's interested in having this future with you, family and all those things, and then you find somebody who's really, really into you in spite of you pushing him away or whatever. Sounds like yeah. you've tried all kinds of different romantic things that probably <laughs> other, other people were probably like, wow, right? Like, it's kind of... Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that... Um, Yes. Yeah. Everybody was, was, you, so he has some pretty extreme beliefs, I would say. And so there was a concern among my friends, you know, that he, that maybe he, we aren't compatible because he's so interested in, in sort of these um, alternative lifestyles or whatever. And, Mm -hmm. and I was just at a point in my life where I felt open to differences and I was, I was forcing myself to to just have an open mind and um, I probably, I probably should have, you know, he, he was a very rigid person from the beginning about his beliefs. And I, I, I do think that that's a red flag for me, at least that, yeah. I mean, looking back, that was definitely a red flag for this situation. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it felt good to be kind of the center of attention and he was, he was cultivating definitely a very like, you know, storybook romance, and I don't know. I just fell into it. Yeah, well, it sounds like he was a pretty, <laughs> pretty professional manipulator. Very, very <laughs> good. I'm sure many I would agree with that. Would have fallen prey to his attention. He sounds really good. Mm-hmm. If you had to. Yeah, he's pretty good put him in a category I mean so you know a lot of times we talk about narcissists he sounds like he's kind of beyond that maybe I mean have you thought about that yeah I mean oh yeah I've definitely thought about that I you know some of the um the research that I did you know after I left and started googling um obviously I found a lot of information on abusive personalities and personality disorders and sociopaths and, you know, that whole spectrum of, of people who are just really skilled at manipulating situations. And um, obviously I'm not a psychologist and I can't diagnose anybody, um, but I can own the fact that when I read about narcissistic abuse, or read about, you know, what it feels like to be at the other end of a sociopath. Mm -hmm. I I relate so strongly. It's like somebody has been sitting on my shoulder and looking Mm -hmm. at my life and, uh, Mm -hmm. and writing about it. And so, I mean, I would have these moments as I was, you know, kind of as I've been going through this past year where I really second guessed myself and I've, you know, thought, well, maybe I'm, maybe it didn't happen like that. Or maybe I'm misremembering it or, you know, uh, because 
I think psychological abuse is so so inherently there's this gaslighting component where they really whittle away your sense of reality and um you know, it would be like if you and I went out for ice cream last week and you had strawberry ice cream and then this week I insist that you had chocolate ice cream and that you're crazy for remembering that you had strawberry ice cream. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, you, so many of those experiences over and over and over, you start to really question how good you are at remembering things. And so that said, I mean, when I would start to, to question whether I was doing the right thing or whether I, you know, I was, maybe misremembering the event. All it took was going back to my book, going back to the website, reading again the symptoms of um, a personality like this. And, I mean, there would be, I would just be reduced to tears every single time because it was 100% exactly what I'd been experiencing. Wow. Um, so at a certain and- point, I, I, I just started trusting myself again. Mm-hmm. And were you doing that reading after you left or while you were still in the relationship? Oh, after I left. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My heart goes out to everybody who is still in a relationship and hiding the books on their Kindle and, you know, um, under their bed or whatever. I, I am not sure if I could have continued putting on the face and, um, Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know how it would have been if I had known about this stuff while I was still in a relationship. Yeah, that's it's really hard to carry around that knowledge and mm-hmm. just have have such conviction that you found the answer, that there's something to this, and then still be under the same roof, especially with little kids, and not know, yeah. okay, now what? And I think a lot of people right. listening to this are in that boat so yeah and that's yep. I guess I don't want to call you lucky because it doesn't sound like <laughs> I mean you're lucky <laughs> you're out obviously you're lucky you're out and you, you do have yeah like, you have good friends and your parents are very supportive but the way that it happened does not sound lucky at all um yeah wow so um the other question that I wanted to ask you about is just you are out. And so you were controlled by this person who's very manipulative and very calculating. It sounds like he knew you inside and out and what to say to kind of get you to do probably whatever he wanted. Um, mm-hmm. Well, how is your life now? I mean, are you thinking your own thoughts every day? What, how does it feel to be away from him, even though you are still connected via your children? What's that like? Well, it's been a process. I would say um, that when I first left, I mean, obviously I was confused. I was grief stricken. I actually got really sick physically mm-hmm. after I left. And I think mm-hmm. it was probably, I mean, I, I believe that it was, you know, my body shutting down just because you know, there's just such a connection, um, mm-hmm. you know, your body and your mind and all of that. So, so I got really sick and I honestly slept. I mean, I slept and I slept and I slept and and I had been in a relationship that was, um, I was, you know, chided for sleeping. I was called lazy. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, expected to always be awake. (laughs) And so I was exhausted and I I think I was suffering from adrenal burnout Mm -hmm. um, from just being in such a a crazy situation. Uh, My cortisol levels were probably all out of whack. And so I, I, I did a lot of sleeping. But I was also just filled with this sense of, um, oh, my God, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> like, I can, I can watch whatever I want on TV. I can, you know, I can sleep whenever I want. I can ask for help. I can, I don't have to hide, you know, receipts in the bottom of the trash so he won't find out. You know, what I ate today, I mm. i mean, it was just like this amazing uh, feeling of, of coming coming away from, from kind of like a prison environment, 
um, yeah. or a police state or something. It just, yeah. that's the way that I've been living. And I, I didn't realize the extent, you know, the stress that I was under when I was in the relationship. And, and I look back and I, you know, I think I was like this little mouse, you know, like hoarding mm-hmm. trash and <laughs> hoarding <laughs> evidence and eating stuff in parking lots of stores because oh I knew I wasn't God. allowed to eat certain things and then throwing out the evidence at the gas station. Like, I mean, it just blows my mind what yeah. I was doing right? just to survive, just to right. survive. Wow. So, so I guess, you know, there was this, this time when I, and it's, I mean, that, that part hasn't left me. I'm just so elated that I can do whatever I want. You know, yeah. I can organize my bookshelf. I can buy whatever I want at the store. You know, if I want to buy frozen vegetables because it's more <laughs> convenient because I'm exhausted, I can, and I'm not going to get interrogated about it. Right. Um, so there are those things. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, recently, his voice has kind of been coming back into my head. And so, you know, every time I kind of think that I'm done being controlled or I I sort of reach this new level of my independence, I realize how, how deep his voice is in my head. Mm -hmm. Um, Telling me that I'm not good at things or that I, you know, that he, he will always win. I mean, that's kind of the latest is I just feel like, you know, he's a person that, you know, nobody ever challenges. Mm. He always wins. <laughs> wow. And when you're on his side, it's, you know, it's great because he's, I don't know, he makes, he makes the world turn. He's yeah. really clever and crafty and he gets what he wants. But when you're on the, the opposite team, it's really scary. Wow. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's definitely still a kid. he's still controlling me, still controlling my thoughts and my what feelings. Is, what has your therapist or your your support groups that you're in? What have they told you about that aspect of this? What what do they recommend that you do to kind of move beyond and heal from that being haunted by his mm-hmm. negative labeling of you and controlling you that way? I mean, I think I'm still discovering that. I think, um, you know, I've done some work with my therapist around just building my confidence back up. And Mm -hmm. um, I think that I, for so long, have just kind of put my needs aside and uh, focused on sort of our goals as a couple and as a family, which really amount to his goals (laughs) that I just sort of, uh, I don't know, I just sort of absorbed his you know, his reality, his perceptions, his opinions, his goals. So a lot of it is kind of exploring who I am and um, exploring what I want and exploring my voice again. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, And so, yeah, and just kind of getting to a new level of understanding that I'm worth it. You know, I'm worth... um, I'm worth this battle and my kids are worth this battle and it's okay to stand up to people. And so, but I, but I, I mean, from, from hearing reactions in my support group, it just seems like it's such a common block. You know, you just get to this place where um, it almost feels like you're immobilized or paralyzed because the voice in your head, which is really his voice is just so strong and so commanding and, mm-hmm. It, it is hard to get out from underneath that. I think it takes it takes reconnecting with the part of yourself that was vibrant, you know, before you met him. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, I describe it as the um, the invisible fence for dogs. You know, those invisible mm-hmm. shock fences. So yeah. you're that dog in the middle and the shock fence has been on and suddenly it's turned off. You can go wherever you want. You can leave anytime. Mm-hmm. But you just you just still feel stuck. You know, you have your days where you feel great, but for the most part you're still just sort of stuck in that small circle mentally. Mm-hmm. That's a great way to describe it. Yeah. And I have yeah. days where I feel like Screw that. And I, and in my case, I was on trolley tracks. There are only certain places that we went 
And so anything I can do to take a different road somewhere, go a little bit further <laughs> than I normally would, mm-hmm. like that to me is elation. I am mixing things up. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I spent the whole summer showing my children new things. We can go further. It doesn't have to be within a you know, five mile radius or 30 minutes or whatever it is. There are so many other things out there. And those were the things, the little joys in my life. And I think it's winter here now. So maybe this is harder to with all the snow, but I'm really feeling that sense of shut in and the self-isolation, which comes along with healing from something like this, because you've been controlled and isolated so much already. But um, yeah, I think I was listening to something the other day that said we are in this club together, those of us who've been through this. And it's, you know, it's not a club where you want to be a member, but nobody else really gets it unless they've actually been through it to describe some of this mental bondage and the, these, yeah. um, you know, it's like they can listen, but they're not really going to get it. The only people who get it are the people who've actually experienced it. So, yeah, it's not I the agree. fun club, <laughs> but uh, it's so good. <laughs> it was so good to have this podcast to be able to talk to other people and hear their stories. And it's just amazing. The same thing comes up again and again and again, even if the circumstances are radically different or the personality type that the person was with significantly different, you know, narcissist versus sociopath versus borderline personality disorder, whatever it is. And, you know, like Mm -hmm. we're not psychologists. We're just seeing the descriptors written somewhere and the little light bulb goes off. Wow. You know, that's, That's what I went through. That's me. It's crazy. Absolutely. It is crazy. It's totally crazy. Well, and I think, um, I think that the part about, you know, that we're kind of in this club and it's not a club that you would, you know, voluntarily join, Mm. but oh my goodness. So, you know, the women that I've met through being part of this club are some of the kindest, most empathic, most compassionate women that I've ever met in my life. Yeah. So how does that happen to so many of us who have, you know, share those characteristics, share the the desire to help. And I I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we're, we're targets. I think that we are, we are, you know, the perfect clay for this scenario Mm -hmm. because we are so empathic and we can find, we can find reasons to forgive so easily and trust so easily. And so Mm -hmm. moving beyond this and not getting back in again, some of those great qualities that we're proud of, we need to kind of rethink and reshape and build, build up more boundaries to keep, keep that good stuff for the people who really deserve it and earn it instead of just being like, Oh, Oh, of course he's like this because of X, Y, and Z or, you know, you're right. I've yeah, never absolutely. ever met this many women. They're all, they're smart. They're extremely giving, kind, empathic, intuitive. It's it's pretty astonishing how across the board that is as well. I think. Mm-hmm. So right. Well, and then on the opposite end, it's like you know we you mentioned that the patterns just kind of keep coming up over and over again with you know in terms of the the abuse tactics and. I think that's one thing that we discuss a lot in the support group is, you know, is, is there a rule book <laughs> that is provided for these abusers? You know, yeah. do they all secretly go to trainings across the country to figure out how to abuse and control? I mean, it, it's kind of mind blowing some of yeah. the similarities, yeah. you know, treating so many pregnancy stories of um, mm-hmm. being treated, you know, pretty miserably or in, being neglected or being, you know, downright abused um, right. during pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And the sleep thing you brought up to me, that's another recurring thing because the control of sleep, just anxiety, not sleeping and that cycle of just lack of sleep. It's, you know, it's a form of torture, but it also, when you have sleep, adequate sleep, you can think clearly. And they don't want you to think clearly, mm. especially if you're smart. Right. Woman, and you know what I mean? Then you're, you're going to be on to them. So it's best for them to keep you sleep deprived and feeling guilty about wanting to sleep. Right. Yeah. 
And it's just right. the simplest thing that it's like, of course, they don't want you to sleep. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's interesting too, because I, I, you know, I, um, in my situation, I can see that the immediate family members that surround my ex uh, are also affected by his abuse. And sleep is one of the things that is, you know, kind of held over everybody's head. It wasn't just me. It was, um, you know, it was his mother. And uh, I actually reconnected with his ex, so the mother of his um, older child. And, and it was the same thing, you know. 